Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Mindset Monday. My name is Sally Garozzo, and this is the place to be to get inspiration and motivation on how to find more inner peace and fulfillment in your life. So today's session is called How to Use the Rules of the Mind for Success. So whether you want more money, whether you want to lose weight, whether you want better relationships or better communication powers, better decision-making powers, uh, more energy, more clients, or just to feel like you are more in control of yourself rather than your anxiety or depression or your OCD or whatever you've got going on, this video is a must watch. So this is for you if you're struggling to take your healthy habits to the next level, if you're struggling with consistency. This is for you if you want to understand why you can't quite get to the other side of success. And this is for you if you just need that jump start <laughs> to get you going. So remember this, success means something different to everyone. And in this video, we're not gonna be discussing what you should be aiming for, but we're gonna be discussing how you personally can get from where you are to where you want to be using the rules of the mind. So do grab a notebook, grab a pen, and let's, let's go. So first of all, I wanna say I'm so thrilled to be back. I've had a few weeks off. I'm feeling excited about um, this new season we're going into. But first of all, I wanna set the scene. I want to start with a little poem about success, and this is by Emerson, the great philosopher. So he writes, to laugh often and much, to win the respect of intelligent people and the affection of children, to earn the appreciation of honest critics and endure the betrayal of false friends, to appreciate beauty, to find the best in others, to leave the world a bit better, whether by a healthy child, a garden patch, a redeemed social condition, to know even one life has breathed easier because you have lived. This is to have succeeded. I love that little poem and I love it because it really speaks to me about what success is. And I would guess that most of you watching this probably feel the same way. Success is about finding meaning, finding purpose, but about helping others to improve their lives as well. Um, and ultimately, you know, this is what we do because we want others to breathe easier. I know that this is one of my big whys. This is why I do what I want to do because helping people feels so good. But how do we get out of our own way here? How do we free ourselves from the blocks to success so that we can live a life with intention really and purpose and deep meaning and feel really really good about it so the four rules of the mind are coming up um, I've spoken about them before in my weight loss program but I haven't put them in the context of success before so it's quite new it's um, an interesting so when I talk about success what I am really talking about here is the movement from where you are to where you want to be. So it might be the movement from not doing public speaking to doing public speaking, or it might be the movement of carrying excess weight to being a healthy weight, or it might be the movement of feeling lonely, anxious, and depressed to feeling connected, calm, and hopeful about life. It might be the movement of feeling stuck in your business or your work life or your career to feeling and having money flowing all around you, joy, meaning and purpose in your life. Or it might be the movement of feeling burnt out, overwhelmed to feeling in control and coping. Or it might be the movement of being chronically ill to being consistently healthy and energized. It could be anything. And I'm sure that you guys watching this have got some of your own ideas and you're very, very welcome to share them here. And if you do share them here, I'll be very happy to give you some tips on how I think you can move in the direction of what you want. 
So I'll say it again, for me, success is about movement. It's the movement of going from where you are to where you want, want to be. So as long as you are moving, I think you can rest in the knowledge that success is going to be inevitable. It's gonna be coming your way. But what we have to do is move consistently in the direction of what is wanted. And I've created another video called The Magic Ingredient to Creating the Life You Want. Um, I'll put a link to that somewhere. And if consistency is your problem, then you might wanna go and watch that. So here's how this is gonna work. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the subconscious mind, then I'm gonna give you my four rules. And then if you watch till the end, I'm gonna give you three hacks that you can do right away to jumpstart you, to get you going. So there's gonna be a lot of information on this. Uh, could probably take about 45 minutes to an hour to cover. So you might wanna jump back in at some point if you don't have that length of time um, right now. So, I'm here today <laughs> to talk about the subconscious mind. That's what I specialize in, I'm a hypnotherapist. So I work with the subconscious mind. And if you don't know how your subconscious mind works, the likelihood is that you will revert back to your old way of being. And the reason you'll do that is because you will simply be using willpower if you're trying to change something. And willpower is great, but it runs out. It only works for so long. And it runs out because it feels like punishment and your brain is designed to move you away from punishment. Um, and so eventually it gives way. But when you understand how the subconscious mind works, um, you can work with your mind and your body and you can start to collaborate with it so that your life uh, works. So your subconscious mind, I believe, is the most powerful part of you. Um, it's the driver of all of your systems, all of your processes. Um, it beats your heart, it grows your nails, it grows your hair. You don't think about it. All the things that happen automatically, language, um, movement, driving your car, walking, breathing, that's all subconscious. But here's the other thing, your subconscious mind is also the mind of your preferences. So your subconscious mind also drives your preferences, okay? Your conscious mind is the mind of choice, so you choose with your conscious mind and you automatically prefer one thing or another with your subconscious mind, so you might for example, you might automatically prefer to, if you're on holiday, you might prefer to sit by the pool rather than go to the beach. And you might prefer to sit by the pool because subconsciously you prefer, um, you don't like the waves, you just prefer that calmness of the pool, maybe it's more organized, maybe it's cleaner, maybe you like having drinks on tap, maybe you don't wanna to have to walk too far. So your subconscious mind prefers the pool but your con, did I say subconscious? Yeah, your subconscious mind prefers the pool, but you could in fact choose to go to the beach, okay? And for some people, it might be vice versa. So here's the premise then. Your success will be determined by the choices that you consciously make, but ultimately your success will be determined by your preferences, I think. Okay, I'll say that again, your success will be determined by the choices that you make for sure, but ultimately will be determined by your preferences. Now I'm gonna come back to that in, this in a moment because it's really, really key. But I wanna talk about a little sidebar. And I think this is very, very interesting when it comes down to success. Um, and I think it goes a long way. Now I believe that we are all in fact programmed for success. Each and every one of us, I believe, programmed for success. Now, we are all experiencing massive groundbreaking success every single day. But some of us perhaps don't perceive it that way. But when you see what's happening, and I'm gonna explain in a minute, you realize that success is actually inevitable. So, 
If you look at the evidence of your life, it's very, very easy to see how you are programmed for success. So I'm gonna make a few little assumptions here and I would assume that you have been happy more than you've been sad. I'm gonna assume that you've been safe more than you've been terrorized. I am going to assume that you've eaten food when you've been hungry more times than you've starved. I am going to assume that you've been able to buy what you needed more often than not. I'm gonna assume that you've slept more nights than you've had insomnia. I'm gonna assume that you've been healthy more times than you've been sick and you've laughed more than you've cried. I'm gonna make those little assumptions. And guess what has been driving all of that? your subconscious mind. Let that sink in, your subconscious mind, aka you, is already wired for success. You have been doing success your whole life and you're already doing success, okay? There's nothing that you have to do, really, apart from understand how it works and then maybe tweak or change a few perspectives or behaviors so that you are working with the flow of success rather than against it. Okay, so just wanna say hi to Martin, Tom, Greg, and Oscarini. Okay, let's go back. So your main, the main job of your subconscious mind is to protect you. That is its job. Its job is to keep you alive and it actually does a pretty fine job um, of keeping you alive. And in this sense, your mind is actually designed to be a bit negative because it is looking for danger all the time. There's a reason we fear things like snakes, cockroaches, rats, because they carry disease in the wild and if we get too close to them we might infect ourselves so we are right to find these kinds of creepy crawly things a bit creepy and so recently <laughs> I went on holiday and I stayed for a week in a forest and it was full of moths it was full of grasshoppers it was full of cockroaches and you know if I didn't check my shoes before I put my um, feet in them you know, I might have caught a disease or I might have got bitten or something. There were scorpions there as well. So we have every right to be a bit negative. We do need to be negative in the same way that we fear heights. If we didn't fear heights, we'd be throwing ourselves off cliffs and, you know, the Eiffel Tower or out of tall buildings. So we need to be negative about some things. We certainly don't want to start walking amongst the traffic um, we really do have to respect our mind for giving us this fear around certain things. It's meant to. Um, and we totally have to respect this negativity. But here's the thing. When you understand that your subconscious mind is designed to help you survive and you understand that it's your job consciously to um, enable you to steer your life so that you can thrive, you get it. So your subconscious mind is designed to help you survive and your conscious mind is designed to help you thrive. But we need a little bit of help when it comes to this. So we're allowed to be negative um, with a view to the fact that it's protection, but let's limit that negativity to say 10% or 15%, 20% if you must. We definitely don't want this negativity spiraling out of control. And then let's use our power of perception to install 90% positivity for our growth. Because as you know, I'm sure you know this, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And that's Dr. Wayne Dyer. So it really is up to us to install 90% positivity, have that 10% negativity there to be a little bit cautious because we wanna change the way that we look at things so that the things we look at change. So for success, we need to form a collaboration between the subconscious mind, the part of you that adopts preferences, and the conscious mind, the part of you that adopts your choices, so that you can create a rock solid mindset which enables, um, which enables you to, hang on, I'm gonna say this again, which enables your ability to face 
fears, get uncomfortable and do things differently. Because as the saying goes, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got, okay? So, I'm gonna talk about the rules of the subconscious mind to help you understand how your mind works and then give you a, a three hacks to help you collaborate with yourself. So if you're ready, I know this is gonna be a bit of a long one, um, but here we go. And Greg, I'm gonna answer you after the video if that's all right, I just wanna maintain my flow. So, rule number one, your mind communicates in words and pictures and it believes those words and pictures. Okay, I'll say that again. Your mind communicates in words and pictures and it always believes those words and pictures. So your subconscious mind receives the words and the pictures that you give it, whether consciously or subconsciously. And it absolutely 100% accepts, accepts them. It believes um, what's going on in your imagination or in real life. And this is why it's so important to feed your mind with words and pictures that you actually prefer. So remember I said before that we're all wired for negativity. Well, if you let your natural tendency for negativity take over, your mind will automatically invent worst case scenarios for you, okay? That is a given, it's automatic. We are wired to focus on what we might lose in order to protect us from pain. So here's the interesting bit. Your subconscious mind cannot tell the difference between what is real and what is imagined. It's got no sense of past or future. So whenever you imagine something, your subconscious mind believes that it's happening right now. So in a sense, we can lie to our brains. We can imbue a situation with whatever meaning we attach to it. And we can do this by being super, super creative with the words and pictures in our head. And that is why I believe creativity or creative pursuits and creative hobbies are so important for your ability to invent words and pictures that you actually prefer. It's massively healing. So coming back to meaning, there's this idea that one person's palace might be another person's prison and one person's prison might be another person's palace. It's all about how you define those words and those pictures that you have in your head. It's so important. So for example, your flight home might be delayed. It's already late, you've got work the next day. You can fill your mind with dread. You can get claustrophobic, you can get more and more stressed the more you think about it. You can imagine, uh, you can imagine it all going tits up and How's that gonna work for you? It's gonna make you feel more and more stressed. Or you can imagine yourself getting home, getting your bags, going to the car, having a good night's sleep, having your coffee the next day, and just getting through the next day as easily and as effort effortlessly as you can. You can see it going really, 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 really well. And what two things do you think your mind is gonna prefer? Well, actually your mind is benign. It doesn't care what imagery you give it, but what it, what it, the signal that it sends into your body chemistry is that does matter. So, you know, if your mind is benign, you might as well choose something that's going to make you feel good. So another one of my clients has got OCD and she finds it really, really hard to leave the house without, you know, cleaning, incessantly cleaning and so part of her treatment is to see herself making a decision to leave the house without cleaning and actually feeling really good about it because if you can rehearse something once or twice in your mind and you can see it going well you can start to create these neural pathways which allow it to happen in real life with less resistance. Now, athletes do this all the time, actors, musicians, dancers, people at the top of their game, they know this, they see themselves winning. So why can't we use the same tools as people who are at the top of their game? Why not? 
it's all available to us. So another example might be you're a bit nervous about putting your prices up, for example, or asking your boss for a raise. But if you see yourself asking your boss for a raise, and if you see him saying, oh yeah, okay, let's give it a go, then you're gonna feel better when it comes to actually doing it. And in the same way, if you wanna put your prices up, see a client saying to you, well, that's perfectly reasonable, I think that's fine then you're gonna feel more confident when it comes to it because you have rehearsed it. Mental rehearsal is so, so, so important for success in any area of your life. It's the same with anything you want. If you want to start eating healthier, you've gotta stop yourself seeing cakes and biscuits and crisps and start seeing salad and you know healthy food, vegetables, fruit. So I would like to invite you to think of what challenges you have, what blocks to success do you currently have, and then look at the language that you have, but also the visual landscape that you have around that block. This is a great eyes closed process if you wanna do this, or you can just notice over the next week or month what kind of words and pictures you're using around your blocks. Um, it's, it's a very good exercise to sort of investigate what's going on. Um, and then it's up to you to change it. It's up to you to choose a different language, to create a different landscape around it, so that you can start to see and feel things differently. Because your mind, the pictures that you create in your mind will talk to your nervous system. Um, and this is what mood boards are. So if you've ever done a mood board, a mood board is an external landscape and it's something that you see regularly and it's something that inspires you and motivates you to um, take action and get what you want in your life. And again, it's this idea that we are constantly in motion towards whatever we want because remember success is just all about motion, it's about movement. Okay, so that's rule number one. Rule number two is this. Your subconscious mind loves what is familiar and automatically rejects what is unfamiliar. So, what does this mean? It means that you will automatically revert to what is known. Another way of putting it is, you crave more of what you do consistently. And I wonder if you've ever noticed this. So the more vegetables you eat, the more vegetables you want. The more sugar you eat, the more sugar you want. The more sex you have, the more sex you want. The less sex you have, the less sex you want. The more negative you are, the easier it is to be negative because it's familiar. The more positive you are, the easier it is to be positive because it's more familiar. The more stuck you are, the more stuck you get, the more you stretch your comfort zone, the more courageous you become, you know, the more public speaking you do, the easier it gets. And even things like sleep, you know, the less you sleep, the less you sleep. <laughs> it's true, because you start getting, that pattern starts getting ingrained in you. The more you worry, the more you worry. <laughs> We really do get addicted to whatever we experience the most of. And even as I was writing this, I was finding myself getting, uh, using the same words and phrases that I've been using for you know, weeks, months, years in fact. So if you wanna change an unhelpful habit or a behavior, you have to make the familiar unfamiliar and you have to make the unfamiliar familiar. And this again is about getting the energy moving because life isn't meant to be static. Okay, life is energy, and energy is meant to flow, it's meant to move, it's meant to transform, and we are all made of energy. And if, if energy doesn't flow, then it builds up like a pressure cooker. And what happens is that causes stress, it causes illness, it causes stagnation, it causes money blocks, it causes fatigue, it causes heart problems, and a build up of tension in your relationships. So we really do have to get the energy moving. And one of the things that we can do is, sorry, I've got a really itchy nose. <laughs> I really just need to give it a scratch, there we go. Um, one of the things we can do is make the familiar unfamiliar 
and the unfamiliar familiar. So how do we do that? Here are some examples. For example, if you want to write a book, you have got to make commitment and dedication and sitting and writing familiar, like JK Rowling. It must be so familiar to her to just sit and write. And you've got to make procrastinating unfamiliar because the mind will automatically reject what is unfamiliar. If you want to become more resilient, you've got to make that positive outlook much more familiar and negativity and worry unfamiliar. If you want to become energized and healthy, you've got to make taking that little afternoon nap familiar and pushing through unfamiliar. If you want to speak up in meetings, you've got to make confidence familiar and self-doubt unfamiliar. If you want to be a thought leader or a coach or a visionary, you've got to make reading, writing, speaking, coaching very, very familiar and perhaps, you know, your old way of life unfamiliar. And <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what I've written here. If you want all those things, yeah, if you want all those things, you've got to stop. I don't understand what I've written there, sorry. So let me bypass that. Once something has become familiar, this is it, a super highway is created in your brain with many, many cars or electrical impulses traveling down it. And when that happens, you have a preference, okay? But before that superhighway is created, you've got to create a dusty old track first, which then becomes a B road, which then becomes an A road, which then becomes a motorway, which then can handle this high level of traffic as it becomes a superhighway. So like I said before, a habit or behavior has to become familiar in order for it to become a preference. So remember, I mentioned at the begin beginning, I said that uh, your subconscious mind is the mind of preference. If you prefer something, you automatically do it. And as habits coach Gretchen Rubin says, once something is a habit, it is no longer a decision. So remember what I said, your conscious mind makes those decisions and choices, but the problem is the conscious mind is very, very RAM heavy. It takes a lot of cognitive fuel, a lot of processing power to make choices and decisions all of the time, and we run out of steam quickly. So for success to be inevitable, what we want, we want to create these healthy habits and we want them to be automatic. And the only way that we can do that is by making them preferences. And the only way we can do that is to make them familiar. So how do we do that? That's the burning question. Well, here it is in one word. And that word is practice. So it takes between 21 to 30 days. I like to say 30 days to be on the safe side. It takes around 30 days to iron in this new habit. And I like to give that stretch of time a name. I like to call that stretch of time Discomfort Street, <laughs> okay? So you've got to walk down Discomfort Street in order to make something go from a choice to a preference, okay? And when you're walking down Discomfort Street, it's weird, it's odd, it's strange, it might even be uncomfortable. But when you know that it's normal to feel odd, weird, strange, uncomfortable, resistant, it can kind of take all the drama out of it because you just know objectively it's going to feel weird until it automatically becomes a preference. And you know why it's happening. It's just a process. It's a mental process. But here's the thing. Discomfort is okay. Discomfort means you're moving. But what is not okay, I believe, is suffering. So discomfort and suffering are two different things. Suffering is staying on your stump, it's not moving anywhere, but when you're in discomfort, you know that you are actually moving. And success is simply the movement in the direction of what is wanted. 
but here is the even better news and this brings me to the next rule of the mind in a minute. If you can link pleasure to discomfort, which sounds a bit s and M, I know, if you can link pleasure to discomfort, you can change the meaning of discomfort altogether. And all successful people know this. A athletes, actors, entrepreneurs, um, if you link pleasure to discomfort, you can change the meaning of it because your mind is ultimately a meaning-making machine. So you can attach a meaning to anything. For example, the a lady I told you about with OCD, who has cleaning OCD, eventually she was able to link pleasure to leaving the house without cleaning because she knew that each time she did, she was actually freeing herself of this condition and that's what she wanted more than anything. And for example, when I came back from that um, retreat in the woods, I had about 20 mosquito bites and they hurt, they were really uncomfortable. And I realized that I could reframe it. I realized that um, this discomfort that I was feeling was my body's natural inflammation system at work and it was healing the bites. So instead of saying to myself, oh my God, I wish these bites would just stop itching, I calmed down, I relaxed, and I said, I'm glad they're itching because that means my body is working perfectly. <laughs> my body's natural defense system is at work here, so I'm pleased that they are itching. And um, it was great because I didn't get involved in any of the drama of it. Um, and all through life, we attach meaning to things that happen to us. For example, if you were bullied as a child, you might have taken that to mean I'm ugly, I'm stupid, I'm worthless, um, but of course that's not true. The truth about the situation is that the kids that were bullying you were probably having a really, really tough time at home, but when you're a kid you don't see it like that, you take it personally and you know maybe your parents were too tired to give you the attention that you needed and you made up your mind that they believed that um, you didn't matter, you were unimportant, your needs weren't met, you weren't seen, and maybe that had a massive effect on you in later life. So we imbue everything with meaning, especially when we're kids. And usually that meaning is negative because our survival minds are so wired to keep us protected from pain, just to literally keep us alive. So, so to recap, make the familiar unfamiliar and the unfamiliar familiar, <laughs> okay? So number three then, your mind automatically moves you away from pain and towards pleasure. Now I was going there with this in the point above. And the main reason why most people never change their habits is because they link pain and fear to the discomfort required to move from where they are to where they want to be. And they're trying to use will and willpower never works because it feels like punishment to the body and your mind is designed to move you away from anything that feels like pain and punishment so this again this is all about changing your language changing the landscape and changing your perspective around the feeling of discomfort so instead of saying things like oh i really want to buy um, that expensive bottle of perfume, but I can't have it, I'm so gutted, oh, woe is me. You could say something like, I could buy it if I wanted to, but I'm choosing not to buy it because I'm choosing to feel great about it, because I'm choosing to invest that money differently. I'm choosing to invest in a massage or in some therapy or in a new course that I wanna do, um, which are better investments. Um, and I'm really, really happy about that. So there you're changing the meaning, you're using language to help you change the meaning. You could say, think, I'm just gonna give you a few examples and then you can change it for yourself. You could say um, about cake, <laughs> I love cake. You could say, I I what I mean is I love using cake as an example. <laughs> I really, really want cake and I can't have it, I'm so gutted. Instead of saying that, say, I could have it, but I'm choosing not to because I'm choosing health, choosing vitality, I'm choosing energy. You could say, um, 
I could choose to clean my house from top to bottom and brush my teeth and clean my hands and nails and my whole body before I leave the house, but I'm choosing not to because I'm choosing to break free. I'm choosing to be in control of myself rather than the OCD being in control of me. I could choose to tell myself negative things about public speaking, but I'm choosing to see it going well. I'm choosing to feel great about the fact that I've put myself forward for this. I'm choosing to feel confident and brilliant about myself. So when you change your perspective like this and you link pleasure to what is coming rather than pain to the denial of what you can't have, you attach a different meaning to a situation. And when you link pleasure to discomfort often enough, it becomes that habit and that preference that we've been talking about and all the hard work is taken out of it, okay? So this is about you linking pleasure to what's coming rather than the denial of what you can't have. So don't focus on the denial of what you can't have, focus on the pleasure, pleasure of what is coming. Okay, more about that in a minute, but rule number four, your mind cannot hold on to a conflicting thought. They cancel each other out. Now, when I learned about this one, my mind was blown. <laughs> okay, so I want you to picture this. I want you to picture a laser beam cutting metal. Okay, the light of a laser beam is so focused on one point, it can actually change matter, okay? Now, everything is energy, our thoughts are energy too, so when your thoughts are all over the place, they scatter, like a light bulb, a light bulb scatters its energy. But if you want to change matter, you need to focus like a laser beam. So be a laser beam, not a light bulb. I love that. So I'm gonna explain a bit deeper. Conflicting thoughts, cancel each other out, okay? I'm sure most of you have heard the term analysis paralysis. When you overanalyze, you draw, you tie yourself up in knots and you don't get anywhere from there. You paralyze yourself. When you overthink, you just don't get anywhere. And um, the clinical term for this is cognitive dissonance. And the effect of cognitive dissonance is always stasis, paralysis, ruts, procrastination, blocks. Hi Jennifer, so lovely to see you. I had a singing lesson with uh, Jennifer years ago. She's amazing. <laughs> Sorry, just completely interrupted my flow there, but I had to say hi. Um, yes, cognitive dissonance always creates stasis, paralysis, stuckness, blocks. And the only way to get past this, again, what I said before, is to move. Coming back to movement again. Okay, so conflicting thoughts arise when you are, um, when what you are believing is not true about the truth of the possibilities and the opportunities all around you. I'm gonna say that again. Conflicting thoughts arise when what you are believing is not true about the truth of the possibilities and opportunities around you, inside of you, okay? It's like you are out of alignment with yourself. So here are some examples of some conflicting thoughts. I really wanna charge more, but I'm scared no one will come to me. Or worse still, I'll get criticized and judged for it. I really wanna do public speaking, but I'm scared of being judged and getting it wrong. I really wanna eat cake, but I know I shouldn't. I really wanna work on my fitness, but I hate exercise. I really wanna to go to networking, but I don't think I've got anything to offer. I really wanna put my offer out there, but I don't think people will like it. I really want a relationship, but I'm scared of commitment. I really wanna start my new business, but I'm scared of being trapped. I really need to rest, but I also need to work. So I'm gonna reframe all of these so that they align with the truth and so that you can then apply this concept to anything in your life that is out of alignment or conflicted. So you can start to practice as you get examples. So the first one, I have to go backwards and forwards, was I really wanna charge more, but I'm scared no one will come to me or worse still, I'll get criticized 
and judged for it. Reframe. I'm gonna put my prices up one increment because that feels comfortable. And the truth is that will attract the right kind of clients. If I put my prices up, I will gain more respect. The second one was, I really wanna do public speaking, but I'm scared of being judged and getting it wrong. Reframe. I wanna do public speaking and it's okay not to please everyone. If I do public speaking, I'm gonna gain so much confidence and experience and it's just gonna get better. Reframe number two. I really want cake, but I know I shouldn't. I can have cake if I want, but I'm choosing not to because I'm choosing health and vitality. Um, I really want to work on my fitness, but I hate exercise and feeling sweaty. I'm cho Reframe. I'm choosing to do the kind of exercise that suits my body. I love the feeling of vitality and achievement afterwards. Okay, next one. I really want to go networking, but I don't think I've got anything to offer. I'm going to commit to networking because I know I have something to offer and I know I'll gain connections. I don't have to be something I'm not. Who I am is enough. Let's do the relationship one. I really want a relationship, but I'm scared of commitment. That's a big one, isn't it? Reframe. If I commit to this relationship and allow myself to be vulnerable, I can find intimacy, connection and depth, which can ultimately feel like freedom. So there you go. There's a few different reframes. Um, you know, the, the, it's endless, the amount of possibilities that there are with reframing this language and perspective. And you have to apply these rules of the mind to whatever you want. And, you know, have them up around your house. So with these reframes, of course, it's all about focusing on the gains rather than the losses. So remember your natural tendency, yeah, like I said earlier, is to focus on the losses, but you have to choose to focus on the gains until it becomes a preference. Okay, again. So instead of thinking of your cognitive dissonance as um, a conflict or a block or resistance, I want you to think of it as an invitation to just move energy, to transform energy, to move a perspective from one thing to the next. And once you focus on the gain and jump into action around it, you are no longer blocked. Because like I said before, success is inevitable. Even if you only get feedback from it, okay. All right, so those are the four rules of the mind. Um, rule number one, your mind communicates in words and pictures and always believes what you tell it. Number two, the subconscious mind loves what is familiar and rejects what is unfamiliar. Number three, your subconscious mind will always move you away from pain and towards pleasure. Number four, your subconscious mind cannot hold on to a conflictive, conflicting thought. They cancel each other out and cause stasis and paralysis. So all of this material I have got from my teacher, Marissa Peer, who is amazing. There's a wealth of information on YouTube about her. Um, so at the end of this video, I'm also going to give you three hacks that you can start implementing right away um, in conjunction with the rules of the mind to literally jumpstart your success. So like I said, it's all about movement, the movement of going from where you are to where you want to be. It's about unblocking, jumpstarting, and um, all that kind of stuff. So fear is one of the main reasons people do not walk down discomfort street. And I'm probably gonna do a whole video on fear because it's such a big subject. It's a major block for all of us. And when we fear, we go into protection mode and we shut down all that is free and liberated and unique in order to kind of defend ourselves, to defend a position within us. And here's a quote from The Untethered Soul. I really love this book. Um, it says, fear doesn't want to feel itself. We manipulate life 
for the purpose of not feeling fear. So we stay stuck, we stay blocked, not moving anywhere. But if you see fear objectively without drama, you understand its purpose and it's easy to move past it. Forget safety and control, forget protection. If you live your life with these values up front, everything around you will become threatening and you will retreat. Your attempts to protect yourself from problems or from fear creates more problems and creates more fear. So I love that. Okay, so just before we get to the hacks then, I just want to explain to you who I am, what I do. So I'm a rapid transformational therapist, I'm a clinical hypnotherapist, and I'm a well-being coach, and I help people move past this fear that's holding them back using the power of their subconscious mind. So um, RTT is a two-hour session done with me at my home studio or done online, and it's powerful because rewiring your mind um, for success is amazing and it's a two I've told you that it's a two hour process so in RTT what we do is we do regression we go back to scenes in your life where you might have picked up these ideas that you don't deserve success you can't move through where have your upper limits come from when you find out you can change them it's really rather amazing so when you know under hypnosis you have clarity Clarity gives you awareness, clarity gives you power. And you know, when, when you get clarity, you can then change the interpretation that you gave those old memories so that you can be free, um, free of the old programming. And by programming, of course, I mean language, I mean that visual landscape, so that you can then begin to live your life just as nature intended, freer, more liberated, moving. <laughs> It's all about movement today, um, and like you're in the driver's seat. So RTT is actually one of the most powerful transformational tools that I personally have come across, and I've tried a lot of different therapies, and it really has changed my life. And I love it because it is rapid, and it's rooted in neuroscience, the science of neuroplasticity. It, it works with your emotions rather than logic, which is what makes it super powerful. So in RTT, rest assured, we don't rehash the past over and over and over again, but we go there a little bit just to get that clarity, just to get that wisdom so that we can move through it and move into the installation process as quickly as possible. So if you work with me, here's what you would get. You'd get a free consultation, first and foremost, where we have a chat and we determine what it is you want to let go of, what fears do you want to let go of? And then we determine what it is that you want because you know the success of the treatment is really dependent on knowing what you want and through our consultation um, we can get real clarity on this so we then do the RTT process either via zoom or here and at the end of the treatment I record a 20 minute personalized recording for you which I set to this beautiful binaural music um, which aids the slowing down of your brain waves and you listen to this for 30 days and you absorb it um, until all of these new habits become preferences. <laughs> Woo, now you understand what I mean. And this is a vital part of your rewiring process because your mind actually learns through repetition. And this is, actually this is another rule of the mind. Your, lear your mind learns through repetition. This is that going down that discomfort street that I spoke about. So if you work with me, you also get 30 days of WhatsApp support. So I can be your pocket coach or your pocket therapist while you are integrating these changes. And then you also get two 30 minute coaching calls with me, which is absolutely essential for your reflection. So I am happy to um, have a free call with anyone who feels like they would want to investigate their blocks a bit further. Um, anyone who feels ready to really jump start their success in any area of their life. So you can contact, you can just drop me a DM or you can go to sallygarozzo.com um, and contact me. You can book a consultation, free consultation through my website. Okay, so as promised then, on to these three hacks. Would you mind if I had a quick drink first? 
Okay, hack number one. Do what you hate first. Get it over and done with. Wake up, spring into action, get that thing that you don't like doing and get it done first. So it might be going to the gym, it might be having a difficult conversation with someone, it might be doing your online shop, it might be preparing your dinner. Slay the dragon at the beginning of the day and then you will feel like a winner. This is what all successful people do because they don't want that thing hanging over their head all through the day because what it does is, if you procrastinate on it, it's gonna drain you of energy and then you know you know what's gonna happen, you ain't gonna do that thing <laughs> at the end of the day because your resources are gonna be limited by the end of the day. You know, we have a certain amount of cognitive fuel which runs out during the day, so if you jump into action first thing in the morning, get it over and done with, you will be using that cognitive fuel that you have the most of at the beginning of the day. Then when it comes to the end of the day and you're feeling a bit more sleepy and relaxed, you can move into that phase of your day. So always slay the dragon first thing in the morning. Be prepared to do what you hate to get what you want, <laughs> okay? Okay, so next one, uh, where are we? Yeah, this is a little bit of a controversial one. This is for those of you who maybe want to start a side hustle or a business uh, with a view to getting out of the rat race, um, but you're struggling to know what that is. So here is my other success hack. Passion doesn't necessarily have to be the driver of success. Now, like I said, this is a bit of a controversial one. So following your bliss in some cases, which is what a lot of the coaches recommend you do and a lot of the spiritual teachers recommend you do, but following your bliss can actually be a very privileged standpoint. And in a lot of cases, a lot of people don't have the privilege, the luxury, the skill or the means to follow their bliss. However, passion can come from success. Okay, what do I mean by that? What I mean is start something, anything. Find a gap in the market, even if it's something you're not totally passionate about and take action on it, move in the direction of it and then let the success of that give you passion. So often I work with clients who are desperately trying to find their passions and I'm like, well, first you've just got to get the energy moving. Always comes back down to that, get moving. <laughs> Um, so just get the energy moving, start something, anything, because I actually also don't believe that you're not passionate about anything because um, I don't believe it's that you're not passionate about something. I believe it's just that you're scared. You're scared of starting something because, you know, of those conflicting beliefs. Um, and most people are scared of failure, so they don't even start. Um, so I would ask you, what did you love doing when you were a kid? Was it running, playing, dancing, drawing, making up plays? Do something around that, even if it's just a side project or an evening project, but if you can't do that, start something, anything, let it be successful, and then your passion will come through the fact that you've become successful at something. And there's no shame in following a path that you're not hugely passionate about. I mean, I don't know many cleaners that are actually passionate about cleaning, but they build huge companies and then they can invest then in what they're more passionate about. So sometimes you have to be prepared to do what you don't want to get what you want. So my third and final hack is invest your money wisely. So when you're moving towards success, you will almost certainly need to get some kind of external help. So you'll need to really collaborate with yourself so that you can create the courage required to spend money in the direction of your success, you know, um, and not on frivolous luxury items that actually aren't an investment. There's a difference between an expense and an investment. Um, so at the moment, I'm heavily investing in a health coach and a personal trainer because I'm really working on a hormone issue that I've got. So I want more health success. 
and it's a leap of faith. You know, you do have to spend uncomfortable amounts of money that um, sort of are a leap of faith. Uh, but nothing says I'm committed to the universe more than when you invest and when you up the stakes by investing in yourself. It says a lot, I think, to the energy of life. And I really live by the expression, fortune favours the bold, fortune favours the brave. And when you support you, life supports you. But most of us are really scared of spending that money required to create success. So what happens? We stay stuck on our stump, we don't move anywhere, um, and that equates as suffering. So making a wise investment with a specialist definitely goes a long way into shifting the energy and to jump-starting uh, you on the road to success. Well, that was a long one, wasn't it? Goodness me, I've been talking for a whole hour so I hope you've enjoyed that. Um, I urge you to watch it from beginning to end. You will get a lot from it. Um, and so now I'm gonna sign off. I'm just gonna say one last thing, actually. <laughs> I'm gonna do a little bit of plugging and promotion for myself. I've got a gig tomorrow at the Nightingale Room above the Grand Central in Brighton with my three-part harmony, vintage harmony trio. So if you love the 1960s style, Andrew Sisters type stuff, um, then come along to our gig. Tickets are just eight pounds or 10 pounds on the door. Um, so that's it. I will see you next week for more Mindset Monday. I don't know what I'm gonna be talking about. Let me know if you've got anything that you want me to cover and we can cover it. All right, guys, thanks so much for watching. See you again next week. Bye.